Hello, everyone. This is the second in my new little quick mini series that I've just called Seven Fateful Passages in the New Testament. And I want to make clear again before I even start into this second one that remember a cautionary note that I made when I presented the first one. And that is, I'm not talking about what these passages may or may not have meant in their original context. But the whole idea is how they've been pulled out and then used very effectively, I think, to cause a lot of harm in the world. And so I'm calling them fateful. In other words, they have great negative consequences. And the one today comes from the Apostle Paul, where Paul says, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. So let's take a look at that. Here's the phrase that I'm interested in. This is from the Apostle Paul. It's in his first letter to the Corinthians, his followers at Corinth in Greece, chapter 7. And apparently they've written him about certain things, maybe based upon what he had said to them when he was with them, because he's no longer there. He's writing a letter to them. And here he takes up one of those issues with the opening affirmation. It is good for a man not to touch a woman. Now, we're going to see as we read on that that also means for a woman not to touch a man. At least in this text, Paul is very reciprocal in his point, as he goes on to say. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, that's the Greek word porneia, doesn't really mean pornography. It means any kind of a sexual relationship outside, for Paul at least, heterosexual marriage. Each man should have his own wife, but notice, and each woman her own husband. So essentially, this phrase that Paul begins with is one that he's affirming, and then he explains what he means by it. He goes on to say, I say this by way of concession, not of command. He's not telling people that they can't get married, as you're going to see, but that he thinks it would be good if everybody lived a celibate life, men and women. And he elaborates this in great detail, as we're going to see. And then he says, I wish that all were as I myself am. Well, what does he mean by that? Paul lived a celibate life. He wasn't married, according to this text and others, where he alludes to that. Now, he might have been married in the past. Some have thought, and I've wondered, whether his wife left him when he joined the movement. Probably in his 30s, from what we could tell. And he says he was raised a Pharisee and a Pharisee of Pharisees, meaning that's from his family background. Uh, you would think that he might have been married. But either way, he says now he wishes everyone would live the single life that he's living. But then he goes on to explain that it's not an order or a requirement. But each has his own special gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. So he does consider it a gift of God to live the non-sexual life. In other words, not to touch a woman and a woman not to touch a man. So even as we begin, you can see that he's approaching the notion of being single or celibate and staying that way as a positive thing. Then he begins to address the different situations. Let's go on. To the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is well for them to remain single as I do. So same thing again. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry. So Paul's been faulted over the ages by more progressive people by saying, oh, so like marriage, the purpose of it is a kind of remedy for fornication, really? Isn't there anything else? So if you're a person who finds sexual temptations overwhelming, then you should get married. Notice, for it is better to marry than to be aflame with passion. So he's very clear about what he's saying. And he even uses the image of a fire, you know, burning with passion. So that would be the unmarried and the widows. They should stay single. It's, it's good if they do that. It's well, okay? Now, we'll go on further down. Now, concerning the single youth, 
uh, literally it's virgins, but in this context, it means young people who are just beginning to come to the age that they might get married. He says, I don't have any command of the Lord. That means from Jesus. And remember, Paul claims to get revelations directly from Jesus. But I give my opinion as one who, by the Lord's mercy, is trustworthy. Now, this is Paul at his best and at his most complex, because he often will say, I'm not ordering you to do this, but, you know, you should do it. And if you're really thinking right, you probably will do it, but I'm not saying you have to. And he goes round and round in this chapter. And then he begins to explain further that statement. I think that in view of the present distress, it's well for a person to remain as he is. So here are all the different situations. Are you bound to a wife? Then don't try to be free. You're married, you're married. Are you free from a wife? Don't seek marriage. Notice that's an imperative. Don't seek marriage. That's what he's saying. I'm advising you don't get married. But if you marry, you're not sinning. And if a girl marries, she doesn't sin. So again, back and forth with male or female. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. So it sounds like he's doing you a favor. In other words, if you get married, you're going to have trouble. Now, he could be talking about external distress and persecution because he's writing this in the 50s AD or CE because we know that during this general period of the 40s, 50s, and 60s leading up to the Jewish revolt, there's a lot of distress and there's a lot of pressure on Jews as well as Christians. And that goes all the way back to Caligula in the 40s through Nero in the 50s into the 60s. And then he does seem to say that that's what he's talking about. I mean, brethren, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they have none. And those who mourn as though they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the form of this world is passing away. So I marked in red the present distress, the appointed time, and that's the appointed time of the end, and the idea that the form, literally in Greek, the schema, the order of things is passing away. And I actually think he even means male, female, slave, free, married, unmarried. All of those things will become irrelevant in the age to come when Jesus returns from heaven, as Paul expected. And Paul thinks that the time has grown short, and notice, very short. Now, this language here, I've got my Bible here. I'm just going to flip it open to Isaiah 24, because I think he has this kind of thing in mind, okay? if you heard my series on apocalypticism. Let me just read this a little bit and think of Paul writing this with this text in mind. Behold, the Lord will lay waste the earth and make it desolate. He will twist its surface and scatter its inhabitants. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priests, as with the slave, so with his master. As with the maid, so with their mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the creditor, so with the debtor. The earth will be utterly laid waste, utterly despoiled. The Lord has spoken this word. And if you go on and read the chapter, it's Isaiah's apocalypse. And it sounds like he's talking about some of the same things if you go on and read the chapter, but you even see it here. So he's expecting that time to come. So as you read this section right here, which is his further elaboration, it sounds like something that uh, I often call an apocalyptic celibacy. In other words, a celibacy because of present circumstances. But remember, the series is not about what a text means in its context necessarily, but how it can be taken out of that context and then applied more universally. Let's go on, because there is more here. There is, in Paul, a sense of what we call asceticism, that maybe it's also more holy and more spiritual, and maybe it's more reflective of your devotion to God to be celibate. And I think he does believe that, in addition to this apocalyptic stuff. So let's keep reading. 
I want you to be free from anxieties, okay? This would cause you anxieties. And remember right here, he says, you're going to have worldly troubles and I don't want you to have worldly troubles. So we go on and you see that he's stepping into another area a little bit here. And you can see that he's bringing up additional issues besides just the times they're living in. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs and how to please his wife. Now, that's an interesting statement. Maybe Paul's reflecting his own experience, and maybe his wife died, or maybe she left him. We just don't know that. But still, the idea that if you're single, you can have a kind of higher spirituality, that gets reflected and added to the phrase that we're talking about, it's good not to touch a woman. So it's not only the circumstances, but also the attitude that if you're really devoted and want to please the Lord, the Lord is Jesus in this case, the Lord Jesus, uh, you're going to be worried about how to please your wife and your interests are divided. So it's not simply survival in a difficult time, just your everyday interests and the things you give your time to and what your focus is in the world. And the unmarried woman or girl is anxious about the affairs of the Lord. Notice how to be holy in body and spirit. So the idea, I don't think he's saying marriage is unholy, but if you're unmarried, a woman who's unmarried, you can really think about what it is to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious or concerned about worldly affairs, how to please her husband. Very, very similar. I say this for your benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So his key is you got to be utterly devoted, and that could still go somewhat with the apocalypticism. So is it apocalyptic celibacy, or does it go further? Let's keep reading. Uh, then you get down to verse 36. If anyone thinks that he's not behaving properly towards his betrothed, this is particularly from the male point of view. So somebody's engaged. You've got to address all the circumstances. You've got unmarried people, married people, widows, and so forth. So what about engaged people? If his passions are strong, same thing again. If this man has determined that his sexual desires are something that he can't control, and it has to be, notice the language, it has to be, I've got to get married, then let him do as he wishes. Let them marry, talking about the woman too. It is no sin. So even though he seems to be allowing freedom, you get the undertone here. It's in the language. If it has to be, once again, it's good to be single, but if you can't do it, if you don't have the strength to do it, and remember what he said up here is even stronger, a temptation to immorality. In other words, if you don't get married, you're probably just going to go out and commit fornication with somebody else. You, you need a wife because of your great desires to be with a woman or a woman with a man again. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity... That is, I don't need to get married. But having his desire under control, this is a very stoic idea that you can control your impulses. And he's determined in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he would do well. In other words, they're not going to consummate the marriage. He doesn't have to abandon the relationship. So he must think the end is really, really near. So again, it sounds very much like what I call apocalyptic celibacy. So that he who marries his betrothed does well, but look, and he who refrains from marriage will do better. So back to here. Is it good or better? That's how he ends. For a man not to touch a woman and a woman not to touch a man. Okay, so we've got a context for that. But with that context, you get the idea, I think, that it's not just the apocalyptic situation. So why is this a fateful passage? Think about it. When the end didn't come, 
then his main reasons as he expresses them right here with the red type would no longer be relevant. So why would you even think of celibacy if the end is not near? And yet, some of the ideas that are behind this phrase, that it's good not to touch a woman and a woman not to touch a man, also have to do with pleasing the Lord, remaining holy, having things like self-control, and marriage is in fact presented in these circumstances as a remedy for sin, a remedy for fornication. In other words, sexual temptation is going to overcome you unless you can be spiritually strong enough. Therefore, get married. Now, here's an example of where this can lead. We've got later letters attributed to Paul. There are 13 letters in the New Testament that have Paul's name on them. So most scholars accept only seven as authentically from Paul's hand. And then you've got some, several that are very close to Paul's hand, but we think are heavily edited, and then others maybe that he didn't even write. And Timothy, the letter of Timothy, seems to have a lot of later material that really does not come from Paul. But what's happening is Pauline thought is getting extended and further applied. So here's a concrete example of a fateful passage up here it's good not to touch a woman, and how it's now getting applied more and more and more in the direction of a mark of holiness. So notice here, honor widows who are real widows. She who is a real widow and is left all alone. So, okay, is it good to be alone? Has set her hope on God and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. Whereas she who is self-indulgent is dead even while she lives. And I take self-indulgence here to basically mean somebody that's still thinking of, quote, the flesh. In the context, the word honor means to support financially. So that's why it says in verse 9, let a widow be enrolled. In other words, she gets the aid or the assistance. If she's not less than 60 years of age, having been the wife of one husband, so she's got to not be having several men, but refuse to enroll younger widows. Notice, for when they grow wanton against Christ, they desire to marry, and so they incur condemnation for having violated their first pledge. So you've got this idea of pledging yourself to Christ almost as a marriage, but we know that within Roman Catholicism among the nuns, and even wearing the wedding ring and so forth. So you can see how what Paul said in the 50s can lead to this elaboration in that direction, and nothing whatsoever about apocalypticism or anything of that nature, but reflecting this ascetic celibate piety as being extremely pleasing to God. So here's what happens, as I think we all know is those elements of devotion and pleasing God and being more able to please God and having self-control were seen as virtues in the Hellenistic world. And as time went on and as the centuries went on, you began to develop the idea that there should be priestly celibacy. So if an individual, a male, is a Roman Catholic priest, it's required of him to live a celibate life. So with that goes the idea of a special level of holiness and devotion to the Lord. So you see how those phrases are being taken and reapplied even in a non-apocalyptic situation. And then you would have brothers and sisters, monks and nuns, who also choose this as a vocation. And as Paul said, it's seen as a gift, that God gives you this gift and so if you're able to receive it, you should receive it. It's a good thing. It's something to be admired. But the church was wise enough to know that you cannot enforce celibacy on an entire religious movement with hundreds and thousands and eventually millions of people. Plus, 
the movement's going to die out because you need children. So what happens is you get this two-tiered system. You have the people who have the gift and are really devoted to the Lord, taking up Paul's words and Paul's language. And whether you're at the end of the age and the time is very, very short in some sort of apocalyptic emergency situation or not, it's seen as a great virtue and a great gift, and that passes into Western history. Well, what's wrong with that? Why would I call it faithful? Because it begins to take the Hellenistic aversion to sexuality that you find in Neoplatonism and you find throughout the Mediterranean world and pull it into this Judeo-Christian movement with its Hebrew and its Jewish roots where marriage is celebrated and, in fact, one of the central gifts or purposes of human life, according to the Hebrew Bible. So let me share my screen again, and let's take a look at the Hebrew Bible. Ever since I published this uh, a few years ago, I think it was during COVID, I decided, uh, you know, to use my time to get this translation out. Uh, I've got a lot of positive feedback from people who are reading it as a new book. So I'm going to use my translation from the transparent English version of Genesis. I'm going to put as a PDF, this PDF right here, I'm going to also link it in the description so you can have your own copy to study. How about that? So you get a sample and you might decide to order the entire book. So as you can see here, here's a translation of Genesis. It's going to read very differently from what you're used to. Look at Genesis 1.1. It doesn't say in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, period, as if he made it out of nothing. It says, at the first of Elohim, creating the skies and the land, the land was desolate and empty and waste and so forth, and then God began to order. So it's actually about the ordering and the populating of the planet not the origin of matter and the universe. But we need to move on. And here we have something very interesting. This is in chapter 2, verse 18, when Yahweh, or Jehovah Elohim, the Lord God, said, okay, I'm going to read it very literally. You ready? Not good. God says, not good. The soil creature, that's Adam. Adam it means dirt, literally red dirt, so I translated it as the soil creature, not dirt because it's not dirty. Soil is clean, right? But he's made out of soil. So not good, the soil creature being by himself. I will make for him a help as one before him. Now, what that means in Hebrew, and notice this note, I'm going to get microscopic with, with you here as one facing him or opposite him as his corresponding counterpart. So it's actually saying, I'll make a etzer, a help for him, kunigdo, as fitting him. In other words, male, female. We still talk about it today. Male and female plugs, they fit together. It's a sexual illusion. Now what you have after is Elohim, is the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim, shapes from soil all the living creatures, creatures of the field, birds, all the soil creatures. They're called life breathers. They're oxygen-breathing creatures. And Adam names them, which means he gets to know them, he talks to them, and so forth. But he did not find a help, a partner, literally, as his one before, meaning I'll look at you and you look at me and we correspond to one another, male and female. So he causes the soil creature to fall into a deep sleep and he takes one of his sides, literally from his side and closes the flesh. And then he builds from the side, literally it's the word he, bana, he, he builds a woman. Uh, okay, he shapes her into a woman, and the woman is Isha, and the word for male or man is Ish, so she's a woman, 
woe, she comes from a man. That's where a woman comes from. And he made her come toward the soul creature. So she brings her forth. And notice this in Hebrew. It's very entertaining when you read it out loud. I'll try to read it for you. And the soul creature said, as he sees Eve, this one, this time, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh, to this one will be called woman, because from a man this one was taken. Notice that this one, this one, this one. So he's kind of excited about it. He seems like he's almost stuttering. The Hebrew word is zot, zot, zot. This one, this one, this one. And then you get the declaration. Therefore, a man, a ish, will leave his father and mother and join, literally, cleave to, you can look at the notes down at below, let's just see what 53 says, to stick to, as in soldering. So it's a strong word in Hebrew. So a man will stick to or glue himself to his woman, and they become one flesh. And that's usually seen as just a description of sexual intercourse. They become one. But it also could refer to children, because in these chapters, you have the idea of be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And that's the first command in the Bible given to humans, to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And so we also have the two becoming one when a child is born. So it could have both meanings. And the two of them were nude, and the soil creature and his woman, they were not ashamed. By the way, nude and shrewd rhyme in English, and in Hebrew, they're very similar words. You can look at the notes. I don't want to go into other subjects, but you get the idea here. So let me stop this share and make some points about this. So here we have the declaration in the Hebrew Bible from the very start in this creation material of Genesis 2 and 3, which is a kind of second creation account, that it's not good for a man and therefore a woman to be alone, that actually they're supposed to be together and joined together, and that that's the purpose of creation. And therefore, you get the command in chapter one, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Someone once said that's the only command humans have ever followed that was given in the Bible, which is kind of a joke, but I guess true when you think about it. So here's what happens. If you take Paul's verse out of context, even though he does to some degree reflect a measure of holiness for the ascetic life, not just because of apocalypticism, that you can be more devoted to God and so forth, but if it's taken out of context and then applied more universally as the church did, then finally, Priests can't get married, and brothers and sisters, monks and nuns can't get married. It is their choice, but there is this idea that everybody can't reach that level of holiness, that we are weak, and that we succumb to our sexual desires, whereas in Genesis, the sexual desires are celebrated. You feel like the hallelujah chorus is going on when Adam finally sees Eve and is enraptured with her and cleaves to her and so forth. And the Hebrew Bible is very frank about sexuality. But when you get into the late Hellenistic world in the first, second, and third centuries, under the influence of philosophies like Neoplatonism, this idea gets absorbed into the Christian church. And all you got to do is read Augustine, read his confessions, his very personal diary about his own struggles with sexuality. And he becomes the model for Christianity, this otherworldly Christianity that wants to leave the world behind and leave sexuality behind and leave the pleasures of the body behind. He talks about sleeping on the floor. Why would you have a comfortable bed? He talks about eating simple food, what we would call bread and water. He talks about not listening to music that would give him too much pleasure because that's going to stir up his earthly passions. This whole thing, once it's in the mouth of Paul, even if it's taken out of context, 
can then spread to the whole world. And all you've got to say in terms of Christianity is, you know, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. It's not required, but it's really good. And Paul recommended it. And if you really want to be devoted to God, whether you're a woman or a man, maybe you should follow it. So I consider that one of the top faithful verses of the New Testament. And I think it's done a lot of damage to people over the ages as they try to live up to these impossible standards and repress their sexuality. But even more important, it pulls Christianity away from its Hebraic roots. The Genesis 1 and 2 thing, where there's rejoicing about the creation and in the creation. And apocalypticism, let's always remember, even though it's predicting this new and wonderful age to come, if it doesn't come, we are left generation after generation to living in this world. And how can we have a stance living in this world if the whole idea is that we should deny the body and deny the flesh, as it's called? We're talking about natural human desires to love and be loved and to express the union that comes between human beings through sexuality. So I'll leave you with that. And next time we'll take up the third fateful passage. As I was downloading and editing this video, it suddenly hit me that I want to add something right at the end here. Some of you know I taught at Notre Dame right after graduate school. It's my first academic job in South Bend, Indiana. And I wasn't raised Roman Catholic. I was raised in the Churches of Christ. Um, my family comes from Texas. Been around Catholics, of course. But I wasn't exposed to Catholicism the way one would be living in a large city like Chicago growing up. So I was hired as the professor of New Testament. And I would teach all the kinds of things that I talk about even in my YouTube channel, Historical Jesus and Paul and all of this, History of Religions, Hellenistic Religions. And of course, some of the students that took the graduate courses I taught were preparing for the priesthood. And uh, then I was around constantly brothers and sisters, monks and nuns, as uh, we sometimes call them, and was very exposed and aware of Catholic culture and so forth. And one of the things I remember when I was teaching Paul in a undergraduate class, and probably 75% of the students in the class come from Roman Catholic backgrounds of various degrees of piety and devotion, as you would expect in college. But whenever I would get to this whole topic about celibacy, I got the idea because they knew brothers or uncles or relatives in their families that had chosen the priesthood. I began to pick up the idea as we would talk about it uh, and, and they would open up and say things. Their idea was something like, uh, wow, if you would do that, that is a ticket to heaven. There seemed to be this notion that you know, God would really reward those who would give up things and sacrifice and really hurt a lot because that would show their devotion or something like that. So I always remembered that but because the idea was very, very few people could do that. And in effect, whoever's saying that is saying, I don't think it's me. I'm certainly not choosing to live my life like that. But if someone did, what more could God ask? So I just wanted to add that. It's just another example, I think, of how this kind of thinking about celibacy can lead to a lot of very strange perceptions about life and its value. Always remember, in Hebrew, when you toast somebody, lachayim to life. So I'll say to all of you, lachayim to life. Thank you.